This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Leddick. Sean Martin McDonald is the CEO of Frontline SMS. Frontline Technologies is used by thousands of organizations to reach tens of millions of people, saving lives, improving healthcare, and building inclusive societies. Frontline was named the number one technology NGO in the world and was listed by the Nominet Trust Social 100 in 2014. Sean is a trustee of the Awesome Foundation DC and an affiliate with Harvard University's Berkman Center. Sean is an advisor to Digital Democracy, DoSomething.org, Ekpat USA, the Law Without Walls program, Tech Change, and UNDP. Sean's a lawyer, barred in New York, and he also holds an MA in International Peace and Conflict Resolution from American University. I spoke with Sean in Kenya. Hi there, Sean. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thank you for the invitation. Where am I calling you today? It's We're calling in early April right now. Where are you sitting? I am on our outside deck, as you can hear from the background noise, uh, <laughs> just outside uh, the iHub in Nairobi, Kenya. Okay, let's let's start there. What the heck is the iHub in Nairobi, Kenya? So the iHub, so the iHub is an upstairs co-working space, which is home to uh, lots of really interesting kind of tech companies and international development groups, and then. It actually, it started a bunch of years ago and then became kind of such a success and such a center for tech that it's, that the organizations that kind of originally helped, you know, originally helped get it off the ground and were originally part of the community have now started to occupy the whole rest of the building. So Frontline has a, an office on the first floor of what's called the Bishop Magua Center, which is uh, sort of colloquially known as the iHub for its popularity. And you've just jogged my memory. This is also connected to the GovHub in DC, right? So the, the Open Gov Hub is, is a, also a co-working space that we occupy. Frontline's entire history seems to be in co-working spaces. That's um, all right. That's the new economy. It's great. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's been great for us, and it gives us, you know, a lot more mobility. But, um, yeah, it is, it is that we find ourselves kind of really enjoying working in, in spaces that are occupied by affinity groups and people thinking over similar problems. And so, you know, the iHub and the Open Gov Hub have both been really great homes for us over the years. Awesome. You know, you've touched on it now a couple of times. Tell us what it is that you're doing right now with Frontline SMS. So I am the CEO of Frontline SMS. Basically, you know, my job is primarily to kind of figure out how do you build really open, really useful, really accessible tools that also provide kind of a sustainable future, not only for us, but for our users. And so most of what I spend my time on is kind of working with partners and working with funders and working with our team to figure out, you know, how does SMS and how does sort of inclusive technology beyond SMS really, you know, what is the potential for it to make an impact in their work and, and who's able to get access to the goods and things that they need? That is awesome. And I want to go down the path of, of what your day to day looks like and how you try to achieve those goals that you just laid out. But first, I've been doing my research, looking through your LinkedIn profile, you know, uh, sort of checking out the background of, of how you got where you are. You've not only had a couple of touch points with Frontline over your career, but you know, you've know you been with IRD and other places. How did you get started in this business? Where, how did you become a development professional? I appreciate your loose usage of the term professional. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's not a super easy question to answer. My grandfather was actually really involved in diplomacy and was also really involved in kind of helping expand the idea that the relationship between countries is not just something that happens government to government. And so from my, you know, you from my to, early Okay, so days, now you, you have to tell me, who was your grandfather? We, you have to tell us all. <laughs> so my grandfather is uh, a, a man named Ambassador John McDonald, uh, and he's the, the founder of an NGO called the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. Um, but he is probably best known for writing the first book on first book on track two diplomacy and started and, and really kind of building out the social sector in a lot of the places that he worked, but also kind of helping to, to connect non-state actors in peace building activities. Um, uh, um, so that is super cool. I, you know, I did not make the connection. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be an IPCR grant from American University, Mr. Oh, we're Ambassador, in- <laughs> Ambassador McDonald's work was, was foundational to me, you know, finishing my degree and being a peace advocate myself. So super cool. Wow, what a, what a small world. I love that. 
So anyway, yes. your, your grandfather started this. So you, from birth, you have had no choice but to be a part of the family. <laughs> Yeah, in my family, it kind of skipped a generation. I think, you know, he casts a pretty long shadow. But I've always had his his kind of view toward bringing more people into processes. How do you work internationally beyond the kind of really connected, really easy problems? And so, you know, I, I kind of first... I, so I've always felt this connection to international work and to to taking a look at big problems. And then... And then I came out of, you know, I went to law school with an interest toward figuring out whether or not law was a system that we could use or, or use more effectively to do this. And, and, you know, law as the kind of institutional arm of conflict resolution. And also was part of the IPCR program at AU, which was a, a really big formative experience for me. We've mentioned that acronym net twice now, and oh, yeah. we just got to tell our listeners what it is. It's the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program at America. There you go. Yeah, and it is also, just to plug it, it is the, I think it is the largest program at the largest international development grad school in the country, um, which is pretty cool. Anyway, I got out of grad school and, you know, I was lucky enough to get a job at a time when it was kind of tough to get a job at an organization called IRD, which, uh, which is International Relief and Development, which for those reading the headlines will know has since fallen into some trouble. I was going to say, they're in not exactly great favor as of this conversation, unfortunately. Yeah, and, you know, my experience with them was an institutional education uh, in a lot of ways. But, you know, at least at that time, the aid field, it was really hard for young professionals to, one, even get jobs, and then, two, to kind of advance in those jobs. And so... Really early on in my work at IRD, I kind of knew that I was going to want to look beyond their walls. And uh, so started trying to, trying to figure out, you know, what are the things that I'm really interested in and what are, the, what are the levers that are really moving the world? And at the time, it was, it was technology. It was how do you gain kind of a contextual understanding for the adoption of use in technology to to help evolve and progress uh, social systems. And so I spent a little under a year at IRD looking at that, and, and actually they gave me great experience and a wonderful opportunity to do some first-person research, where I, you know, which I based my master's thesis on, and then moved on to a technology company called Metro Star Systems. And Metro Star Systems was my first technology job. I was very green. And... You know, they were, they remain actually a really interesting international development consultancy in the fact, in the sense that they work with state and they work with USAID, but that they don't have large international projection. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of global offices, or at least they didn't when I worked there. Can I put a pause there for a second? And you've just touched on something I think many people find a challenge or have put up a barrier for themselves in that they are non-technical or they don't have a tech degree, but they love tech and they love, you know, they, they want to be a part of it and they see that that really is a huge piece of the future. How did you make the case to MetroStar? You, you, know, so you came in with, you know, an IPCR degree for crying out loud. How did you make the case and, and how would you encourage others to make that case that you have something to contribute, you have something valuable to put in the table? My whole career is probably a study in building connections between systems. And I think that the people who are able to have kind of one foot in multiple places and speak fluently to lots of different communities are those that really, you know, that have a lot of opportunity across different career paths and different organization types. And so, you know, I had just worked with MetroStar on kind of a business development process for IRD, and I think that they had seen that I was able to speak to the development community and kind of get them to internalize technology at a time when, you know, people over a certain age were making lots of jokes about what an absurd name Twitter was and all kinds of other things. Uh, and so, you know, really it was just a I guess if there's one bit of advice, it's that all you know, keep an eye on partners, and that partners are very often looking for people in all of their work. The good organizations are always have one eye on talent, 
and they're always trying to acquire the people that they have the best experiences with. And so, you know, every meeting with a partner and every, every project is an opportunity to kind of build that relationship that can turn into another job. Mm, excellent. So, so Metro Stark sort of gave you your kickstart or your, your leap into technology and then that led you to Frontline SMS again? Well, so kind of funnily, and not funny because of the substance of this, but because of the timing, my very first day at Metro Star was the day of the Haiti earthquake. And I That's literally got... serendipitous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was certainly a moment. I got pulled out of orientation, you know, where they said, oh my gosh, this is happening. You know, what can, what can we do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm just learning about what you do. And so we had this whole kind of process where we were... Where, you know, MetroStar, I think, very genuinely was really interested in, in being supportive and actually ended up making kind of a big investment in aiding what became a really powerful volunteer technology effort. And so the very first weekend after the Haiti earthquake, there was something called uh, Crisis Camp, where a whole bunch of volunteer technologists got together and I was, you know, again, very green, but went to this grouping and started to get a, a sense from both the activity and the volunteers and the other organizations around the table. And, you know, was fortunate to have a, a mentor there uh, who was able to introduce me around a little bit, but really kind of got a sense for this is what deploying technology in one of the most difficult possible situations looks like. And you know, maintained a presence in that volunteer community, but it was at that event that I met someone from Frontline and we kept in touch and kind of over time really started to value the work of the organization and admire it, you know, and kind of, and then I think that part of, part of the way that I see technology is not really about technology, but it's about the anthropology that surrounds it. You know, it's looking at how does how do people interact? What is the social context around technology and its adoption and its uses and, and all of those things? And so for me, SMS, and particularly the kind of work that Frontline was really starting to do at the time, was truly transformational or, or had the potential to be. And so, you know, not too long after, as it became clear that, you know, that MetroStar, while being a great organization, was not where I wanted to spend a lot of my career ended up kind of going out on a limb and pitching the Frontline SMS legal project to Josh Nesbitt, who's the founder of the Frontline Medic Project, which is now Medic Mobile, which is a, a truly amazing organization on its own, and Ken, who's the founder of Frontline. And they were, to my great surprise, both really receptive and positive about it. Uh, and so managed to, I mean, and that was the beginning of the Frontline legal project and, and the beginning of my kind of relationship with Frontline SMS. So now we need to just crack the nut for a little bit. What exactly does Frontline SMS do, for those of us who don't know? <laughs> so Frontline SMS actually doesn't even do what most people think it does. <laughs> but So what Frontline SMS is... I've found is that that's always the best business model, by the way. Make sure you do, don't do anything they think you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People love that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different, probably, podcast um, with a lot more crying, I'm sure. But the, in the meantime, this is, so Frontline SMS, ha, uh, it started as a, a tool to do better SMS engagement. And SMS is short message service or text messaging for the uninitiated. It is the world's most used data channel. Uh, it has 3.6 billion active users and continues to grow substantially every year. It's accessible on every device, uh, every telephone, and, uh, and, and really is one of the world's just most prolific and most used messaging platforms, even now, 20 two plus years after its, after its development. The thing about SMS though is that because it happens on phones, there aren't great tools. And so Frontline SMS was started in 2005 as this really excellent tool to start doing, to start connecting both offline populations and to bring this degree of professionalism to SMS engagement. And really what, what's happened is that you find, or that we found that that as, you know, if you can build a, a process that adds value to an organization, that makes something more efficient, that makes it more affordable or accessible using SMS, you can do it in almost any digital medium. And so what really started for us as, you know, is this an interesting, is it an interesting tool? What can you do with it? You know, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of users later, we have gotten to this point where what we've realized is like we're not, you know, we deliver a lot of things through SMS. But what Frontline really does is it really helps users get this granular understanding of how they communicate and, and be able to kind of automate pieces of that to make it a lot more effective and efficient, but also allow some manual administration so that when things fall off the rails or when people do unexpected things, there's still that very real, very personal one-to-one -one connection. Expand on that a little bit for me. What does it mean, granular understanding of how they communicate? Like, Can you give me a, a specific example maybe from a project that you're running right now that, that would help us understand that? Yeah, absolutely. So the slight difference in understanding is that like, you know, historically when you buy a communication service, you buy a telephone line, right? And so what you do is you pay for it on a monthly basis and you think about it just like people call me and I pick up and I talk to them and then we, they talk back and then we hang up. But when you're talking about digital and text-based communications, it's significantly more back and forth. Right, so we're doing, um, we're, we're designing a campaign with a conservation group in Indonesia right now. And what they're doing is they've, they've set up all of these kind of posters where people can text in and get started by volunteering to be part of this really inspirational campaign. And so from the campaigner's perspective, you know, they've had to, when someone texts in this keyword, I then prompt them with, the, X response, you know, welcome to the campaign, great to hear from you, just want to ask you a few questions to get started. And then another text message, which is probably, tell us your name. And so then the person responds with their name, and then it says, great name, you know, lovely to meet you, can you tell us where you live? And then it, you know, there's a, a little bit of back and forth in that exchange, and then what often happens is that that person, based on their answers, will get added to a couple of groups, you know, which may help them get informed about local events, or it may give them, you know, informative tips, or it may ask them quiz questions based on a training. But when you're designing that kind of communication, what I mean by granular is that you've really got to think, like, I say hello, and then they say something. And what is that thing that I want them to say that is important? And then how do I respond to that? And so you're designing this kind of user journey, but you're doing it in this very conversational way through text messaging. Mm. Frontline's been around for a while now, and you've been with them for quite a long time, actually, in, in technology terms, right, in the, in the world of technology. Tell us about an initiative or a project or you know, an event that you've seen over the last couple of years that you, know, you went out, you rolled out a product, maybe it's, it's legal, or maybe it's health, or maybe it's radio, where you just had some unexpected results. You thought, hey, this is going to work in this way, but it either ended up working completely differently or had you know, massive results you didn't expect. Sure. I'll do two really quick ones, one, one tough one and one really great one. So when I started the Frontline Legal Project, you know, e even today, text messaging and legal services is a really small market. And it's not that it won't get there because it's really important and we're starting to get some really amazing traction or continuing to get some really amazing traction, but it's still a very small ecosystem. And so it took me kind of a long time to get the ball rolling. But when I did, I, I, you know, we got a Google Impact Award to work with an organization that I, was, that I remain totally inspired by, a group called Landesa. And the project was, how do we use text messaging to make the process of getting access to a land title in the state of Odisha, which is in India, more accessible? How do we make it easier to do and more efficient? So this is my dream project at this point, and I've been working toward this in one way or another for years before it lands. And when it does land, we get really excited, we hire some brilliant people, and we go out and you know, are getting started with the project, and, and there's a natural disaster. Hmm. And, and, <laughs> and as you can imagine, natural disasters have the tendency to complicate bureaucratic processes as well as project rollouts. So that threw us for a loop. You know, and, and then we kind of got its, you know, the office and thankfully a lot of the area kind of recovered even better than, than one might have expected. And then there was another one. Are these floods or are these earthquakes? What are they? 
so I, yeah, so it was, it was a cyclone. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so then, after, you know, again, kind of knocked down, but not out and got up, you know, back to it. And then there's a presidential election. <laughs> if you've ever worked in India, I'm sure some of the people here have, a presidential election is, is no small event. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. the, the government, you know, really, really focuses on it. And, and sometimes, you know, to the procedural detriment of other things. So anyway, ser- long series of events later, kind of get through the presidential election. Some policy changes happen that fundamentally change the frame of the project, but kind of gives us also this really fantastic opportunity to experiment. And so, you know, this thing that I've been working on and building toward for years and years and years has now taken this totally different but really equally exciting shape, but, you know, in much smaller pockets, largely because of kind of all of these events that no one could have predicted. And I think that when you work in difficult environments, like that's a really, it's a really, you know, you have to kind of expect the unexpected or expect that things are very li- un- very unlikely to begin or to end as they begin, mm. uh, you know, which is why so many great development professionals have, have done much smarter advocacy for flexibility and funding and, and all of that kind of stuff that's, that's really started to take hold in the development world. So now tell us about the one that you were, is the happy story. Because that, ha- <laughs> that was a pretty happy ending. I'm, I'm really excited to hear what the happy story is. Well, so Frontline, when we first arrived, when I first arrived, uh, had over the kind of seven years of being used, had in the neighborhood of about 30,000 downloads. And it was this really fantastic tool, but it was also really starting to show signs of strain and age. And so the team at the time, which was a really small, really young group of people, decided that what we were going to do was completely rewrite the platform. And, you know, that's, in the technology space, any, you know, every new platform choice is a risk. And to start from zero, from something that had gotten what felt like initial success, was really dangerous. And we spent lots of time, you know, going through agile and iterative design, consulting with users, trying to build back and build back better. And, and there were, you know, and, and we had kind of like this epic series of back and forths about like, do we absolutely need this? Do we absolutely not need this? Is it good enough? Is it not good enough? And, and you know, you always kind of go through that. In 2012, we re-released Frontline version 2, and within 18 months of release, it had 225,000 downloads, which was an enormous relief. Yeah, <laughs> but it was also wow. kind of like six times, you know, six, seven times what it had had in, in, in its previous history. And so... You know, it was this, for a group of not, you know, for like you mentioned earlier, right, lots of people, I think, look at technology and think, okay, I don't know how to write in JavaScript, or I don't know how to code in a particular language, or, you know, I'm not, I don't have the depth or ben- bench of experience that a lot of coders do, and so I'm not confident enough to build technology. And I think in the development space, the thing is, is that you're not building for coders most of the time, right? that, that a lot of the people who run organizations, even while there is this huge movement toward really developing and, and excited e- uh, technology ecosystems, a lot of the people that we're all really trying to reach are people who feel exactly the same way. And what that means is that if you're, you know, if you're participating in that design process, in a lot of ways, your opinions are as or more important than the opinions of the people who know how to code and will think about how to solve this problem in a totally different way. Mm. And to this day, my kind of inability to code is something that I'm able to turn into an asset in, in discussions with my very technical team because I'm able to challenge and question assumptions. Sure, that are you walk made. in and you say, hey, that UI, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to start over. I'm sorry, <laughs> I just don't get it. So yeah, when you're thinking about designing, sometimes limitation is a feature. And your own limited understanding can be a really great filter to, to run this through. How does Frontline SMS measure its success? Is it just downloads? Is it, have you developed a, a monitoring evaluation system that is proprietary to your work? Are there, are there other measures of success that you're, you're really looking for that you hold dear? That's a great question. And it's been a real evolution for us. 
we started by really measuring just sheer downloads. And just because, you know, is there interest, is there volume, are we relevant? And, you know, got past the point finally, you know, where we were able to look beyond that and really start digging in. And I think, I just actually, I just wrote something for opensource.com, which is kind of, is a written version of, of our evolution through this. But, I mean, to answer the question <laughs> succinctly, the way that I really view success now is when we are able to go into working with a partner or working with a user and take something that they did or something that they do in an ongoing way and make it faster and smarter and more efficient and more people, you know, and make it available to more people. In a view that is admittedly reductionist, from a communication technology perspective, I really believe that some of the most important work that we can do is improve systemic efficiency and improve the number of people who are able to, to work through that system. You know, and, and Frontline has, has really been able to do some transform some very transformative, very measurable work. And then we also, you know, and then we also have, we have qualitative things which are inspirational, but I think harder to measure. Supported one group we love dearly and work with frequently um, in the Ebola response. We've been, you know, helpful in a number of natural disaster responses, and we've been really supportive to a lot of organizations that I think do some of the most exciting, valuable work out there. And so there's the very practical, what does our success look like? Are we meeting performance metrics? Are we helping users meet their goals? And then there's the qualitative part, which is, are we doing work we believe in? Are we present where it matters and where we can do the most good? And I think that we've been really lucky to, to mostly be able to answer those questions positively. And, and are you, as the CEO, how often are you in touch with that sort of that conversation about measuring that success is, are you checking in quarterly, biannually, monthly, weekly, daily? <laughs> I think about every 45 seconds I have a, 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 a thought about whether or not we're doing it well enough. I mean, not, so that's probably not the most, so I, I mean, daily for sure. I think, you know, I think that there's a whole bunch of really interesting questions to ask around how centrally development actors need to own or hold data about users. At times they're interesting and then there are times they're really uncomfortable questions about how much user tracking it really makes sense for a technology platform to do. Uh, and I think so, so that's something we wrestle with a lot too. Um, but you know, we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time with those thoughts and with those measurements. Mm. How does Frontline SMS keep the lights on? Are you donor driven? Do you get paid for every text message? Are you taking a slice or what's, what's your model? That's a great question too. So we started as donor driven and, you know, really owe a lot of fantastic donors, you know, everything for how we've gotten to here. But I'm really, so SMS is a, is a platform that costs money to use and because it, I mean, and when I say cost money to use, I mean, it costs money per message. So you really, you know, when we're talking about granularity earlier, like it is, you pay for every interaction you have. So every interaction needs to be valuable to an end user. And for us, you know, one of the things that has been a really interesting development in the technology space is the kind of courage of charging users for the value that you provide to them. And so... Frontline started as completely funder-driven, and then we developed a consulting practice which kind of took the lessons that we'd learned and a lot of the technology that we'd developed and started helping users to apply it in a really dedicated way. And now we've launched Frontline Cloud, which is a software-as-a-service platform and is something that we think will really both help us and a number of our users start forming more significant, more valuable connections to the systems that ultimately determine kind of how it is that they work and live. But the, I mean, we charge for frontline cloud uh, on a monthly basis. We charge for consulting uh, on a time basis and we just hustle, you know, we work really hard and we cut, we don't cut quality corners, but we, you know, we fly, we fly coach and we, sure, you know, absolutely. we, we work in, we work in, uh, in very efficient ways to get kind of the most out. But like, the other thing that we've learned, right, is nine years in, we're still basically in startup mode. And past a certain point in any organization's history, I think you've got to start planning beyond that. So Frontline is now really in the middle of this 
organic transition to a more self-sustaining, technology-driven future. What does the next five years look like? But I'd like for you to characterize it in both for Frontline. You started talking about Frontline Cloud, and maybe there's other products or services you'll be rolling out. But you specifically, are you, are you still going to be running Frontline? Or do you see yourself transitioning to another, you know, another part of this, this uh, serendipitous career of yours? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I think I would love to still be running Frontline in five years. I've always been really fascinated. This is actually a realization that came to me kind of embarrassingly late in life. But the thing that I'm kind of most interested in, the problem that I, in all of my jobs and all of my careers, have really kind of been hacking at from different perspectives is this question of how do we determine what information is worth? You know, I, what I, the idea for my master's thesis originally came from this question of, we do a lot of reaction to newspapers, but most people don't read past the first couple of pages. You know, what is the value of a story on page 12 if you're not directly mentioned or implicated in it? And even if you are, like, why do you react to it? Through a long series of, as you said, sort of serendipitous mistakes, SMS is, is in many ways the kind of platform that has the most direct relationship between cost and efficiency in terms of how we communicate information. And so, you know, to that end, I think that where we're going with Frontline is making it a lot easier to start measuring the quality and quantity and cost efficiency of communication processes, of communication workflows. And that that, to me, as a, as a series of questions and potentially a series of answers, just couldn't be more fascinating. So in five years, I'd really love for Frontline to be you know, a bigger team and engaged in lots of really exciting work. But I, you know, I'm also really looking forward to the things that we're building that will make it a lot easier for, for users and customers and clients to start taking an eyes wide open approach to designing communication that is both valuable to them and valuable to their end users uh, and, and making things kind of the, the way that I refer to it is symmetrical in value, and you know, and that that we really kind of design for organizations who who live in building symmetries of value between themselves and and their users and their customers, and that's I think probably one of our deepest and most abiding values. And so, as long as I get to keep working on that kind of project, I think I'll be over the moon. The last question that I have for you is one that I ask each of the guests here on terms of reference. Most of our listeners are people who are transitioning into the development and aid world from a different sector or who have just sort of completed a master's degree like you and I did many moons ago and are looking for that first gig or, or trying, you know, basically just thinking to themselves, how do I create a career out of this? What are your one or two critical pieces of advice? You alluded to some earlier, but what are your one or two critical pieces of advice for how to create sort of the sustainability and the satisfaction that you've experienced? I think... For me, it's being, you know, I guess, like you said, a lot of it comes from serendipity. And so trying to tell someone, like, you should definitely do that, you know, try and take a career path has never been something that's been particularly fruitful for me. I think that where I have been really happy and really fulfilled is in being able to pursue the things that I'm interested in and getting a clearer and clearer and clearer view of what that looks like. And so when people ask me for career advice, I always ask them, you know, do you know what part of the world you want to live in? Do you know what problem you want to solve? And do you know what approach or what, you know, how you would like to solve it? And you don't always need answers to all three of those questions. And then, you know, answers to those three questions may change over time. But being able to answer any two of those, you know, I really want to work on healthcare in East Africa, or I really want to work on um, access to justice in South America. You know, th th those things really start to become guidelines. And from there, you know, when you can start to express how and why you get to those decisions, getting jobs becomes a lot easier because people, and I say, and, you know, I'm saying this as an employer, I hire people as much based on you know, understanding what motivates them and what, what they're in it for as I do what they walk in the door with. I mean, you can always learn skills. It's very difficult to learn a motivation. You know, and then the second thing that I would say is, you know, within reason, because everyone should be paid for their work, don't hesitate to volunteer. 
you know, I think people tend to trust each other more in, volunteer, in volunteering communities and contexts. And most of the things that I have ever seen become big markets started as communities of people who really believed in building a set of skills and helping, you know, helping solve a set of problems. And, you know, the transition from community to market is a difficult one. And, you know, it's not easy on, on, onto itself, but getting involved in volunteer communities and really continuing to learn about both the problem, the people who have that problem and, you know, interesting and thoughtful approaches to solving it. Like those three things end up becoming kind of, foundational pillars of what becomes a very fulfilling career. Sean, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us out there in Nairobi today. Thank you for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes.